My name is Tom Waddleton. So I'm going to facilitate today's session. And so administratively, let me just tell you a couple different things about the session, like other CPE sessions that you've been to. Um, so this, there is one credit offered. And Chad, if you can go to the second slide, we'll show this for today's session. We do need you to attend all 50 minutes of the session. And we do have three polling questions. First one's coming up really soon. One of our common questions we get is, what about CPE certificates and presentation for this? And those both will be mailed out during the time. The way that you can best interact with us is to use the question function and go to webinar. And Chad, Jake, and I will all be monitoring that during the session and answering questions either directly in there or if it's better for the open forum, they won't be asking the speaker for those. Um, so let's go ahead and continue on. I'll tell you just a little bit about the company that Jake and I work for. Summit CPA Group. So since 2004, we have offered CFO services, um, back office accounting services to our clients. In 2013, we went fully distributed. So our firm is entirely remote. Um, we work from different locations, gives us a lot of flexibility with employees and with clients. The location doesn't matter for where they are. And we have 55 employees, most of them in the US, but some outside the US. And so that kind of demonstrates that flexibility. So that's a little bit about us. Let me tell you just a little bit about our speakers today. Um, so Chad Wade is a senior partner uh, of marketing and a manager with Divi. He's gonna be doing most of the presentation today and we're really excited about hearing about these three services that you can provide. And then Jake Grimm is the director of technology at Summit CPA Group. Um, we have a fair amount of experience with Divi. And so I think we've got some things to add into there. So Jake and Chad, welcome. Chad, I'll turn it over to you and then in a couple of minutes, I'll launch that first polling question. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, possibly afternoon where you're at. I uh, very much hope you enjoyed that intro up to this point. Uh, and welcome to three new CAS services uh, that your firm should know about. Uh, we hope this is a very, very informative uh, use of an hour for you. And uh, the goal here is to have you walk away with some, uh, so, some new ideas on how your firm can pivot towards uh, offering some additional advisory services for your clients. Uh, by, by way of introduction, my name is Chad Waite. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm the Senior Partner Marketing Manager here at uh, Divi. Uh, Divi, of course, being an expense and spend management platform, we'll talk a little bit more about this as most of these CAS services are related to, to Divi, but also the idea that new financial technology options out there uh, are typically what are powering a lot of CAS, uh, CAS pushes for firms. Uh, a little bit about me just quickly. Uh, I am a husband of one, a father of two, and a biker of uh, four different types of bikes. Uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, my kids and wife would probably argue that I have too many. I would argue that that's a very appropriate number, but we'll leave that for another time. Uh, and I think most importantly, and for context in this presentation, I am not an accountant, uh, not at all. The financial world uh, before coming to Divi was a little bit of an unknown for me. But the advantage for that in a situation like this is that uh, it gives me maybe a little bit of a different eye on how we are working from a company level like Divi uh, with accounting firms to actually kind of challenge the status quo, right? Um, I'm not locked into, you know, the ways of kind of traditionally, you know, closing the books and uh, doing things in a manner that is, is again, you know, possibly familiar, but, you know, it allows me the ability to kind of see how firms are saying, hey, you know, let's, let's challenge what we know. Let's bring some, uh, some additional, uh, you know, technology and some other ways of solving the same problems that we've been solving for a long time and actually injecting it to our firm. And what we can ultimately do is distill that down into a presentation like this. So a quick little overview for the agenda. Um, and then after this, we will launch the first of three polling questions. Just a quick reminder, you do need to answer these three questions in order to receive your CPE credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but the agenda for today, problem overview, we're going to talk just a little bit about um, you know, what we're trying to solve in this, why CAS is even the hot topic it is, uh, the ideal outcomes that we want you to learn. And uh, of course, the ideal outcomes are probably well informed by the three bullet points below. Uh, the three services that your firm can now inject into your offerings to your clients to both extract 
business from your existing clients and hopefully make you more marketable for new customers. And that is the goal of all of this, right? How does this impact your bottom line and the ability for your firm to better service your uh, clients and most importantly, get new business, you know, make that revenue and, uh, you know, grow as a company. So uh, with that, uh, Tom, why don't you go ahead and fire up the first polling question here? Okay. It is out there. Yep. So if people will go ahead and answer that, we'll leave this up for a short time and watch for a high percent who have answered this and then we'll be in good shape. So sure, Chad, you mentioned you're not an accountant. I would assume one of the benefits that I could see in that is a huge part of what Divi is offering. Accounting firms definitely can use it, but for those customers, having a view as to sort of how do you, what are the problems you're trying to solve and not do it through an accountant's lens, but maybe a little bit more through the, the lens that's closer to the clients themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually a really good point because the lens through the client is oftentimes um, mired in, for example, confusion, right? Like, like if you're a new business or you're an established business looking to redo your financial tech stack, um, or maybe you don't even know you need to, maybe there's efficiencies that you can now see as an accounting, you know, firm or, or a partner for them, but they can't see necessarily themselves. Um, that tends to be how Divi looks at this. You know, again, I, I mentioned the words status quo. We challenge a little bit of what, what most CPAs that we talk to are comfortable with, but it's mm -hmm. all in the idea of making things a little bit more uh, streamlined for them and helpful for the clients, which ultimately doing something in the best, you know, in the best interest of your client is, is really the North Star for hopefully everybody on this. Yeah, I'll give about 10 more seconds. Um, so we have more than 25% right now are saying they're in 25 plus firms. So a little bit bigger firms that are in there. Sure. Like we often see the less than 10 is about 60% that's in there, which sure. isn't that surprising. So let me go ahead and close this down, but gives you some idea, mostly smaller firms, which isn't surprising probably to you, um, but more big firms than what we often see. Oh, and let me uh, just get back to my... Uh... Forgot that the uh, polls yep. knock off the. Uh, that was one of your kids. So. Huh? One of your children. <laughs> that, was one of, that, was one, that was what. That was one of my children. Yes. 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 Um, and just for some uh, some background, we we ask that uh, we ask that question because we you know we like to know who we're talking to, who we're uh, you know who we're actually speaking to because obviously if you're a single person CPA, uh, your experience is going to be a little bit more different from. Uh, that of say like a 70 person firm. And so we just want to make sure that, that there is, you know, there's, there's a very good message here. So let's go ahead and get started. We're about seven minutes in uh, problem overview, ladies and gentlemen, the financial tech landscape, uh, this can get messy. Um, as accountants, you're probably used to dealing with a little bit of everything from all these columns, right? There are Corporate and personal cards that that your clients are using to to facilitate the purchases for their their companies for their business spend. Uh, there are likely expense management solutions, Expensify, Concur, systems like that that are generally aimed at helping manage some of that spend that occurs on the credit cards. But those by default are very separate entities, right? They're not tied in one to one with the card. Uh, you also have, if you have a client who does a lot of travel, especially now that, you know, we have a summer where most lockdowns have been lifted, sales teams are going back out, customer service is going out, you know, business travel has kind of come back into play. Um, so a lot of business travel, which is oftentimes a very large cost center for businesses that you have to manage. Uh, and then just accounts payable, bill pay, all the fun stuff that comes to the invoice that your clients get. And then consolidating all of that activity into singular places, right? So budgeting software, accounting software, most you know, people that we talk to are using NetSuite or QuickBooks of some variation. And when you step back and you look at this from a high level, that is a lot of very siloed, disparate areas, right? You have logins to each and every place. You have multiple individuals who are actually using these, these platforms at your clients. I mean, uh, uh, Tom or Jake, maybe give me a little uh, uh, snippet here, but for your end, I mean, do you, how many people on an average client would you say are spending on, you know, either their own corporate cards or personal cards and trying to use like Expensify or something to try to manage their, that spend activity? Like what would be an average? Oh, that's a, um, my guess is um, maybe 25% or so, mm -hmm. uh, or so. I mean, uh, as you, as uh, you mentioned earlier on, as, as we've gotten more, 
accustomed to Divi and the platform that it's offered uh, over the last you know couple of years. We've we used to have a lo- uh, probably a higher amount on Expensify, uh, but as you know, slowly migrated more and more over to the Divi platform uh, for some of the benefits that it offers. But um, I would still say there's probably a good 25% that are still on Expensify. Yeah, and sure. I would add to that um, many of the new clients who work with, especially the mo- smaller companies, don't have any solution that's good. That you've got the owner saying, I use my card. Sometimes I'll just give it to employees to use. But when it comes to someone being reimbursed, they have a, a really poor process. And so that's often when we're trying to recommend a solution. Yeah, and that's really interesting you say that too, because one, one of the things that we see is that that, that problem is typically manageable when you know maybe they're just getting started there's five or ten employees and it's not the most uniform or streamlined of process but as they start to add more people to the company as it starts to become that that growth that they're aiming for um those processes are are very detrimental in that growth and sure. i think that's one of the interesting things that you know when we talk about the word cas which we'll get to here in a minute um you know, being proactive and looking at that and saying, how can we help our clients basically nip that in the bud before it becomes a problem instead mm-hmm. of reactive or responsive to it? It's generally one of the big things. And, and that, that problem in and of itself is powered by this, right? You have siloed solutions that are all going towards the same thing, right? They're helping a company basically spend money and make money and have their business operations function, but they're disparate, they're siloed, they don't talk to each other. And as you can see in this slide at the bottom, we are going to be talking through a lot of these services with the lens of the Divi platform. Now, this isn't necessarily a hard sell, and there certainly are other programs who do something similar to Divi out there, but we view this through the idea that if you can unify the financial tech landscape and you can look at financial operations from a singular and holistic platform versus having everything disparate, and again, I mentioned siloed, um, it it opens up some very interesting options, not only from the management side, but how you can transfer those management sides into actionable service offerings for your clients. Uh, So I guess to level set, again, we're not trying to make this a sales pitch by any means to Divi, but it does help to know what Divi does just so you understand the context behind some of these uh, talking points. So uh, Divi essentially combines what has been separated for years and years up to this point the spending mechanism for a business, AKA the credit card, and the actual software used to manage that spending, right? Uh, Maybe in theory, it's not the most bold of ideas out there, uh, but it's very hard to execute because the software mechanism and uh, and spending mechanism are two very, very, very different things and oftentimes very hard to meld together. Uh, So Divi is... come in and done that. And essentially what it means is that anytime there is a purchase on a Divi credit card, there is software that has a reactive nature to it. So if it's swiped, uh, you can immediately turn around if you're the person who swiped it. And in fact, I'll actually give you an example here. I'm I'm kind of ad-libbing this, so forgive me, but this is a Divi card right here. If I swipe this, there is an app on my phone that says, hey, Chad, you just made a purchase. Why don't you upload your receipt, categorize it there, uh, and thereby eliminating expense reports and really putting the onus of uh, receipt capture and plain receipt chaser on the actual person who's doing the spending. So uh, that's just kind of a high overview. There's a lot of additional things we'll talk about here. Okay, so uh, so I want to go back, though, to the, the problem statement here. So 2020, we just came off of a pandemic year, a very interesting year because it basically took anything that we thought was a tried and true set in stone lesson and threw to the wind, right? Um, Tom, Jake, I'm sure you guys probably had a, a tumultuous year in terms of the type of problems you would solve. I'm sure if everybody had their webcams on, we'd be seeing, you know, the ubiquitous head nod. Um, But the the, the really, the unifying thing here was when when COVID hit in earnest and the lockdowns hit, CPAs ultimately became the front lines, right? Like they were the first call to help save a client's business, right? How do we reduce our costs? How do we make sure we're not going over budget? How are we going to apply for something like the PPP loan? Like all of a sudden we all became experts on applying for the PPP loan uh, Mm -hmm. out of necessity, right? Um, And and that was just what you did. It was to save your clients. The SMB space was hurting and you became not only the business partner, but the people who were the lifeline uh, to, to saving businesses. But with that came kind of this interesting paradigm shift. The services of an accountant were also now on the chopping block, right? When 
every single thing was under scrutiny by one of your clients, even if they were turning to you as the person to help save their businesses, they were sure. also looking at every single expense and negotiating it um, or, or determining if it was reasonable to keep it. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the time, you know, of course, we, we accountants were like, yes, we are very vital to your business, uh, especially if we're helping you secure more funds and a loan from the government and all that fun stuff. But um, I, I mean, Tom and Jake, like when, when, when this hit, how long did it take you to get, you know, the, how long did it take for PPP requests to basically come into full swing? My, my guess is you got a pretty big flood of those clients asking for help. It was immediate. Um, Jake could probably concur. It, you'll, most people probably remember that, you know, the loans and the news about PPP came out fairly long before all the details were coming out. So we were getting requests to apply before the rules and the applications were even there. And it was yeah. for everybody. And it was interesting too, mm -hmm. because on that note, it was always so fluid with like, I remember, you know, the, the loans and the application guidelines were one thing, but then the forgiveness guidelines, you know, were so fluid and changing and came out months and months after that, it, it kind of kept streaming you along, stringing you along as well to become this expert on something that was such an enigma, you know, sure. with any defined rules. And um, yeah, and the, the banks weren't ready. And then, if you remember initially, and they did run out of money, but everyone felt like it was scarce, so everyone wanted to be in the front of the line if they could. And so we were trying; everyone was trying to go as fast as they could. Yeah, that's an interesting point, actually, because one thing it did was challenge the the efficacy and preparedness of very established financial institutions, too, right? Uh, for something like this, the agility of a very, very established bank that you know people would go to that that companies were using, I mean, it it, it showed the flaws in the system, right? That they they were not at all prepared to facilitate this kind of thing, and that actually is a really good segue into this last point for accounting firms. It's supercharged, absolutely supercharged, the need to move to CAS. So I, I want to talk about what CAS is, right? Because we all have some sort of definition for it. Um, but it's interesting what, it, you know, it helps to level set what this is. Now, there was a, a blog post by a um, company called Analytics Finance and Accounting. They did this back in October of last year. And I really loved the, the, uh, the description that they had of what CAS is. So it says the objective and scope of modern CAS goes beyond traditional activities and tasks that are usually handled by the firm or the client. CAS involves customizing your accountant if they're accounting advisory solutions and tailoring them to the unique business needs of your client, thereby adding value to your business. Now, that is a little kind of maybe pie in the sky, pie in the sky conceptual, but the idea is that it's white gloved, right? Like you are going to be now providing certain advisory services for your clients that go beyond maybe the commodity office offerings that you've had as an accounting firm in the past. Um, this is good though, because that last sentence, thereby adding value to their business. The goal behind CAS and what we should always be driving towards is to make your practice a better partner, an actual business partner and not just the vendor to your clients. And again, 2020 exemplified this, right? Like you were the business partner by providing a bunch of guidance on the PPP. You were the business partner by finding every single place that you can start to reduce the cost of operation for your clients and save them money because every penny counted. And a lot of your clients, I would imagine, are in the same place. So that is CAS. Now, what this doesn't do is give you the actual playbook, right? So we've defined CAS, and we now know that there are a fair amount of companies or, or firms out there who can create revenue from CAS. But what that does is it leaves a very big void in the middle of it. What do you actually do and offer to your clients to take advantage of advisory services that are bringing in a substantial amount of revenue and providing an opportunity for you to become a better business partner? That is the question. Um, so the objectives, understand what CAS is, we're going to learn the three new CAS offerings, and then learn how to uh, market some of those offerings to bring in clients. That's pretty uh, basic. Like the marketing is more how to actually speak to this, again, outside of being a commodity service. So keep in mind that as you're looking at these services, distill it down to how you're able to go through and talk to it with both your existing clients um, as an additional service offering, but also how to make it something that you can attract new business in because 
I guess maybe the, the lens, the lens that you can view all of this through is if you have a new customer coming in, they're comparing your firm versus another and all things held equal, you're able to offer whatever service it is that we're talking about right there. It's the only thing that's different. How much more valuable does that make your firm versus a competitor? How much more marketable are you in order to win that business or again, extract mm -hmm. business from the new client or from your existing clients? Uh, so let's dive right into this. Um, um, before we do though, really quickly, uh, Tom or Jake, any, any other uh, input or fillings on CAS, anything that might be helpful in just kind of level setting all of this before we dive into the actual services? If Jake doesn't have anything, um, one thing I would think of for this, it is so common that what we're hearing, if you listen to like, or read AICPA journals, things like that, it is such a common refrain of clients don't need us to look backwards and tell them what happened. They're looking for that advice going forward. And I'm not sure I've read a recent sort of accounting kind of journal that didn't have that as one of the key themes that we all have to shift our business and move more toward advisory. If I had a photographic memory, I would repeat this verbatim. Uh, I do not, but I saw this excellent quote um, um, from a uh, from a company at a, or from a firm at an event that we were just at um, mm -hmm. that said, you know, our, the purpose of our CAS environment is to proactively solve problems versus retroactively put out fires uh, yeah. or something to that degree. And I, I thought, man, that is like that is it, right? Like that is that that in a nutshell, that is what they want to be doing on behalf of their clients. And I just thought that was so insightful and still down to a single sentence because what you're saying is the truth. Like we don't wanna be looking in the rear view mirror to say, how could we have done that better? And why do we keep always having to look backwards instead of saying, how do we fix this well before these things become a problem? So- Sure, and you could uh, probably even be a little bit more cynical, Chad, and change that to say, it's, it's not putting out fires in the past, it's pointing and saying, there was a fire. We have a picture of it and can tell you about it. Right, because many of them is just more, here's what happened. And I think many clients are like, okay, I'm getting good enough that I can look at my accounting system and see what happened. I need your help and how to make it something better. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. I think I think that's well taken in that it's not even an actionable thing when you're looking in the past, but it's more just an identification thing. But the what do you do about it is probably, sure. you know, the time to do that's well past. So that's that's yeah, that's a great point. Okay. Uh, let's look into some actual services then here. Um, and before I do, I'm just going to check the questions box, make sure we're not missing anything. Great. I think we're like okay. Uh, right and ready to go. Okay. So cast service number one, never going over budget again. Uh, do you know what the worst word ever is when you're talking to clients? It is budget, right? Nobody likes to <laughs> talk about budget. I uh, usually get eye rolls, you usually get size. Um, budgets is never a fun thing to talk about, but it's always this thing in the back of the mind where as you're trying to help a, a client close the books or, or you know, figure out what was actually spent, there's generally kind of this assumption that, you know, there's a number that you don't really want to go over, whether it's something that's defined or not. And so one of the most common things that we see with, um, with, uh, Divi partners, accounting firm partners who are in the Divi partner program, is that they they learned how to use fintech to basically proactively solve the problem of not even just defining a budget, uh, but also saying, okay, how do we how do we actually make this an enforceable thing? So, um, my goodness gracious, my uh, my is it going backwards instead of forwards? I don't know what yeah. it's doing to be honest. Give me give me two seconds. Apologies about this. Sure. I, I usually use Google Docs and sites didn't want to do it. Okay, there we go. So here's here's a uh, timeline we can all get used to here, uh, or that we have all been through, right? Uh, again, if we had webcams on, you'd probably be seeing everybody go like, yes, we've been mm -hmm. through this, right? You have the start of the month, uh, goes to the end of the month. And as an accountant, you're probably doing a lot of manual tasks like chasing receipts and getting employees of the clients that you work with to submit their expense reports for any business spend on their personal cards. And of course there's the reimbursement window. And this is not only arduous, it's just super annoying, right? I mean, everybody, the, the, the image of the shoebox of receipts being plopped down on the table. Sure. And, the issue here is that that red line is essentially your enemy, 
uh, but it is also your client's entity because the the month worth of spend or whatever time frame it is you don't know what was actually done what was actually spent what needs to be reimbursed you don't know until that manual work has been done and that's generally well after when you want to close out the books i mean we were just talking about looking in the rearview mirror here it is right uh more than that this perpetuates what we call financial babysitting so when <laughs> You know, when you are having to send the emails out to clients, send you know, or make the phone calls and basically find where the receipts are, uh, find what this transaction was actually for, you know, uh, was buying, you know, a bunch of fast food actually a business lunch or was mm -hmm. it somebody inadvertently putting it on the corporate credit card uh, for dinner for their family, right? These are the type of items that accountants just hate, but it's status quo. Um. I, Tom, I, my, my guess is that you probably spend a lot of time or, or did uh, a lot of time doing this, at least at some point in Summit CPA's you know, lifetime. Yeah, for the ones who don't have expense management, definitely. And sometimes the owners are the challenging ones where if we don't have access to their credit card, we don't get the credit card statement from them. And so then you're just you're guessing or you're telling them their month was better than what they thought. Um, Jake, in addition to that, what do you, what do you think? I think the big thing too is um, with a lot of clients, it's kind of like what you let into about your budgets that you set for the year and not going over budget again, but then also having a real time ability for the client to know where they're at in their budgets. That was always a big arduous process that we would have before of trying to get data one reconciled in QuickBooks and then export it out to a certain report to then, you know, show them like, hey, your budget was. 100 grand and you spent 60 so thou 60 thousand so far this year you have 40 left and by that time they might have already made plans on other things that they thought they had more yep. budget left or vice versa and it's it just becomes a big issue and so that's definitely one of the biggest things is like cutting down that window so they know real time what you know what what amount of their budget have they spent and how much do they have left um yeah, that's a that's a great point. You mentioned you mentioned those two key words, real time, right? Because this this red line right here, that is not real time. That is that is about the antithesis of real time. So, um, absolute adherence to budget numbers thing. So this is cash service number one. And again, we say this with the lens of Divi, but the idea now is that if you live in a world where you can help your your clients pair their spending activity with the actual spending mechanisms and software needed to manage that spend in real time, using those keywords again, you're able to build out things like enforceable budgets. Okay, so uh, with Divi, for example, you can give every single person at your client's uh, uh, business a credit card, which sounds scary, until you realize that those credit cards don't work until you you assign them a budget to draw from. and. Here's where the advisory aspect comes in because, um, Jake, you just said it perfectly, right? You're, you're like, well, maybe the client has budgeted to spend $100,000 for the year. Uh, maybe they've spent 60, and all of a sudden they're making all these other plans for different projects or different initiatives, and you either may not know about it or they thought that they had more budget to go into it. Here, as an advisor, is where you can come in and say, look, we're going to work with you, Mr. or Mrs. Clients, and we're going to say, what are your big initiatives for the year? And how do you break those down into more bite-sized budgets, right? Like, do we have departmental budgets for the quarter or the month? Do we have project-based budgets that we know can't exceed this amount? Uh, do we have individuals who we know can't spend more than this, right? And, and, and the way that we see this advice happening from a CAS perspective is, is, is accounting firms come in and they say, okay, well, uh, as your CPA, I would recommend that you build out, you know, a company budget on this, a departmental level budget here for, uh, you know, for marketing or sales or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and then um, project-based levels here. And it gets it down to the point where in real time, you can see money, uh, you know, being spent, being reserved. And then ultimately that has been, that amount that has been allocated for whatever, a uh, uh, project or department it is that you've built it up for. This to businesses is a lovely idea and typically pretty terrifying to build out, right? Because they don't know, like they don't know how to make this sort of action item. And, and more than that, they don't have the time, which beca because of that mm -hmm. is about the biggest market that 
anybody can get to when it comes to um, when it comes to advice, like, like again, saying, look, let us work with you to build out budgets. You'll never spend over again. Um, we'll charge you this extra fee, but if we're nixing, you know, five or 10 grand and overspending a month, this is great, right? This benefits you hugely and you get the real time data. Uh, and something like this is entirely doable with a platform like Divi. Uh, again, there are other ones out there, but this is the new age of FinTech that's bringing this type of spend methodology and management to the forefront. And, you know, we're still at the early adoption of the bell curve, right? Like accounting firms are not veteran in this yet. Those early adopters who are doing this are winning all of the business for this type of advice. And I think the thing that's really important to kind of back up and, and make sure that we understand here is that the paradigm shift here isn't even necessarily about the enforceable budgets, but, but Jake, it's much like what you said. There, there is a real-time data flow now. That red line, um, this red line right here is essentially next, right? And what you're doing is you're seeing all data from all spend, from all employees in one place in a dashboard that is actually done in real time, where the spending mechanism is reconciled immediately against the management mechanism of that. And then all that information is just put right into your accounting software. Mm -hmm. um, Jake, you, you obviously are, are the lead person on the tech side uh, for Summit CPA. How, how different of a mindset is this from what most of your clients maybe come in uh, doing within their own businesses? Yeah, the, a lot of people come in, as Tom mentioned, with not really a good process in place at all. And it becomes um, something where they're just kind of, when they think about it, they'll they'll take a statement at the end of the month and kind of go through and, and look at it and get stuff fed into QuickBooks and try to use their accounting platform to tell them, you know, what their spend was over a certain time frame. And then it becomes, you know, it just becomes so far removed from where they're, where they're at today. You know, it becomes a 45-day lag at a minimum typically out of the gate when people come aboard so it's just it's uh you know that's probably the biggest thing is their the processes a lot of times are all over the place and then it's just not it's just not in a in a real-time state um it's and sometimes it's not even happening at all with people um you know they'll it's like once a quarter they'll right. think about looking at it and stuff like that and mm -hmm. it's just you know they look at the bank account and feel like yep i can i can buy this and it doesn't necessarily have a bigger picture look on um, you know, what, what was the overall plan for the year and how does that fit into the plan? Well, and I just think, I think one thing that's important is, is the ubiquity of insight from every, every person involved in the financial operations, right? So I think mean, it's funny, you mentioned a moment ago, you're like, oh, like the CEO won't even give us his credit card login. So we don't get the statement until, you know, whenever right. they decide to send it over. Right. And so like, like there, there's a uniformity in having all eyes in one place, with all activity wrapped up into a singular dashboard. And that's, again, that is the paradigm shift, right? And it enables things like keeping your clients beholden certain budget numbers and not allowing them to go over because the cards will turn off. They will not work when you hit that budget cap. Um, so let's go to number two. And after the second one, we'll go for a polling question uh, right before the third one, Tom, just to uh, okay. be aware of that. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll jump right into number two, eliminating reimbursements. I hate reimbursements. Um, I hate reimbursements as somebody who's not an accountant. I hate reimbursements by having to put any sort of spend for the company on my own personal credit card and float that payment. Uh, yes, the points are great, and no, it is absolutely not worth the headache for waiting, you know, 30 to 60 days for people to figure out exactly what it is that you need to reimburse me and then getting it over into whatever mechanism, whether it's a check or through payroll, it is a gigantic pain in the butt. I hate it. Guess who hates it even more than I do? Accountants. Reimbursements are a massive pain and we want to eliminate them with absolute malice here. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we talked a little bit about this uh, before, but that is probably the scariest sentence that you could approach your client with. Corporate cards for all, right? Nobody, nobody like, again, if you, if you went to any one of your clients and said, hey, how would you feel about giving a corporate credit card to every single person in your company? How many of them would say yes? I'm sure not a lot would. J Jake, if you went to this, if, if you went to some and you said, hey, let's give corporate credit cards to everyone uh, in your company, to all of your clients, how many of them would push back heavily on that? 
Oh yeah, high majority. <laughs> if not, if not everyone, but but pretty close to everyone. Yeah. Because everybody's scared of the traditional way uh, that credit cards function, right? You give them a credit card. Now everybody has a spending mechanism that is only limited by a specific line. There is no enforcement in the real time, you know, world mm -hmm. of those credit cards to say, is this line being used appropriately or not? And generally, you find that out once you get the uh, the you know the um, statement at the end of the month. And you're like, oh my gosh, this person racked up their line and all they did was, you know, spend it on stuff that wasn't relevant to the business. So it's problematic. People are scared of it. Your clients will probably push back very heavily because there's no control around it. But, but what that yields is a couple bad habits within the financial world, right? It leads to card sharing. So if I'm the one manager and I have five people on my team and I only have the corporate card, they're all going to come and grab my card, right? It makes it messy and and makes five people responsible for keeping track of their receipts for one person's card. It's, it's a terrible way to card share and get people to spend on the actual corporate card. More than that, though, it leads to this problem, the one that we are trying to solve, reimbursements. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to, well, some people do, but it, it, people put the spend on their own personal cards, and that creates an administrative burden for everyone involved. So, with Divi and with modern fintech, what we encourage is that there actually is an approach where there is corporate cards for everyone. Empower your clients' employees, right? Have them all feel good by saying, yes, we trust you with a corporate credit card. But with the caveat that there are extreme precautions taken on those credit cards. Again, these don't work. Divi cards don't work unless that person has been assigned a budget. OK, mm -hmm. which means that they can't spend a card and they can't max out a line because there's not. It's almost like a charge card. There's nothing available to spend until you explicitly say you have from this budget to spend from. So no more personal cards. I mean, imagine being able to go to your clients and say, hey, look, we're going to eliminate expense reports or uh, um, um, personal reimbursements and expense reports, too, uh, by nixing all personal cards and giving everybody a credit card. But don't worry, we're going to retain complete control, and you're never going to have somebody who's a rogue spender again. Uh, spending enforcement, right? You'll never have to worry about not only overspend, but misspending within a budget, because you see that in real time, controlled by actionable budgets. And then the speed and visibility. Again, don't wait for the statement to come out from the CEO who's reluctant to give you the login. You have clear visibility and spending activity in real time. So if somebody is spending you know, on, on something that they shouldn't, and they're pulling it from a budget, you have the ability to shut that card down immediately and talk to that employee and say, hey, tell us a little bit more information about why this was a necessary purchase for this budget and this project. Here's a big thing. Though. Um, we mentioned this uh, a moment ago. Actually, it looks like there's a question quickly. Excuse me. It's, it's, the one that, like that might apply, Chad, yeah, the, most uh, clients upload their receipts to QBO and you match those up. So how would Divi change that? I think you've answered that, but we'd love to hear. Yeah, so so I'll give you the example again. And uh, so somebody swipes their Divi credit card. Uh, they they buy something online. They buy something physically in a store. Uh, what happens is is that card is tied directly to an app on their phone. There's a one to one relationship between the spending mechanism and right here. Uh, on the app. And we become, Divi becomes the receipt police. We say, hey, Chad, you just spent something at McDonald's. Uh, was that a corporate meal? Can you please upload the receipt? Can you categorize a transaction? And anything that is captured within Divi is now automatically ported over to um, to QBO. And the you know the GL codes, chart of accounts, all match one to one, right? So you're not losing any of the data uh, synchronizing, but you're also making sure that the onus of receipt capture and the expense management is done on the person who is actually spending. More than that, it's not in hindsight. It's done in real time right there in the moment. And that's all ported over directly to QBO. Uh, that's a great question. Looks like we have a few more. Let me uh, go ahead and jump into these. Uh, so it says, uh, how does Divi and QBO sync and integrate? Uh, you just heard it. There's a direct uh, integration, a very deep integration with QBO and Divi. We also uh, directly integrate with NetSuite, and we have integrations coming up with uh, basically every other major accounting platform uh, here very shortly. So uh, with that, we have, does uh, Divi sync with ZeroNet yet? Uh, not at the moment. We have very customized export options currently, but Zero is on the, uh, the hot list for one of the next accounting uh, software platforms to be integrated with. 
And then here is the question since most people like their airline miles or cash back benefits for spending through their credit card. How does Divi respond to this? Aha, it's a great question. We'll call this the bonus. We'll call this the bonus SaaS uh, or CAS offering that you have. A great question, David. Um, so Divi not only has points back, but I, I want to talk to you guys about a another paradigm shift, right? People have their credit cards. They love their Amex multipliers. And they love to fly their family out to Hawaii twice a year because they get their airline miles. But if you are at, and we're just going to totally spitball hypothetical here. Say your your client has 50 employees. Five of them have corporate cards. Uh, and maybe half the business is doing spending every month. And you're having to do 25 or 20 of those, those employees on reimbursements, right? So five of the 25 spending have corporate cards. 20 of the 25 spending are putting it on their personal cards. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter how good your Amex multiplier is. If you're missing 80% of the company's spend going to personal cards, if you can consolidate all of that spend onto a singular platform like Divi, and every single dollar and penny spent in the name of corporate spending is now racking up uh, uh, reward points for the company, that is a map that's that beats out any multiplier ever okay because you're capturing it all more than that divi's point system is relatively competitive depending on how often you pay off your invoice you can get as high as a seven times uh, multiplier on the point so I, to answer your question in a nutshell yes divi has uh, not only great point structures but when you capture all corporate spend on a credit card mm -hmm. versus reimbursements it's huge it makes it a much much different ball game yeah so yeah, just for time card check, card. we've got about nine minutes left for your portion. Perfect. So I think you're doing well, but. Great. Uh, you know what? Let me go ahead and pause the screen share. Uh, Tom, would you mind doing the uh, the third polling question here, or the second uh, rather? Yep. Uh, okay. That polling question is up now. So we've talked about recommendations and you've talked about FinTech. A fair amount, Chad. So this gets to that and to what extent are people currently recommending software solutions to their clients? Yeah, and, and we ask this because, uh, you know, it, it, some firms can be relatively agnostic to, you know, the, the tech that they recommend. They want their clients to be able to make the informed choices. Other firms are, are relatively vehement in what they see as being most effective. And we just like to keep our thumb on the pulse of this, especially as CAS becomes a bigger service uh, or, or the, the financial tech side of it. I mean, we have on here, Jake is the leader of the tech side for, for Summit, right? So th there's a lot of um, dedication that we're seeing now from firms going into the technology side. We're always curious to see, you know, what ratio of firms, you know, how are they actually looking at tech? Are, are they vehemently recommending it? Are they letting the client still kind of make the primary choices? And how does that you know, factor into the way that you manage your clients. Chad, so I'm curious with that, since it's recommending, if you look at Divi, software as a service kind of thing, if a firm recommends Divi, to what extent do you think that firm kind of takes on technical support and training and those kinds of things that might make someone reluctant? Ah, that's a great question. Um, and I actually think that that hits the nail on the head with some of the, the hesitation for firms to actually make recommendations is, if the tech solution drops the ball on usability, on customer support, on something, um, you know, they don't want the finger to go back to them, which is why I would say, first and foremost, as firms, um, I would use the tech that you're recommending, right? Uh, that's always a big thing is like, uh, you know, eat the dog food you're recommending to your clients. Um, Divi, for example, we, we don't have contracts and we don't have cost. We make our money every time a credit card is swiped, which means that if we're not providing the best experience for your clients, uh, we are absolutely not going to make money, which means that the experience from an actual usability standpoint has to be fantastic, but the customer support side of it has to be top notch. Um, and most firms who are relying on recommending software are saying, look, we, we want to become the experts, but we don't want to become the customer service tech help desk, right? Like that's not our sure. goal of this. So it's and, and it's and it's hard, okay. right? You want to make sure that who you're recommending is doing that. So let's yeah. go ahead and uh, continue this. Yep. yep. So you could see we had 38% said frequently they do recommend, and 38% also said occasionally. So we ended up with about 25% right. seldom or never. Great, great. That's fantastic. And and I do think that that speaks to a little bit more of a cutting edge, um, you know, a audience here because 
most of the time, some of the you know, larger firms, a lot of the incumbent ones, uh, you know, are, are slower to move in actually helping their clients understand the tech space. Uh, so the third service we'll look at, uh, we'll make this one rather quick, virtual cards and security. Man, I, I swear, I, I can't remember the last time that like a month hasn't gone by where, or, or has gone by where I didn't hear about, you know, some sort of, um, you know, security breach, some sort of hack, some sort of ransomware. Uh, fraud and, and security is becoming a very hot topic. And not that accountants are, you know, cybersecurity experts, nor should they be, but there are reasonable steps that you can take to your clients to say, look, let's just increase your security uh, in, in ways that incrementally improve it, but don't impact how much time you're actually spending on this. So cash service number three is virtual cards. And how do you use these suckers to improve your client's security, right? So uh, whoop, virtual cards, of course, uh, uh, are non-physical cards. I kept holding up my physical Divi card that you can see in the camera here. Uh, virtual cards are just like that, except they don't exist. You create numbers online and they are virtually created. So the issue is this. There, there are oftentimes one business card to many vendors. Uh, you take the founders Amex and, you know, all of their monthly billing and subscriptions are put on their one card. They go on vacation. They lose the card. Guess what? Now you have to spend half a day updating a new card for every single vendor. Uh, it does not prevent against overcharges. You can't get any visibility into what there's what charging you and uh, charging you what until you get the statement and there's no security. Uh, if that one card gets compromised, it is a failure point for every single thing that is being billed to that card. So virtual cards come in on the right-hand side here and change it up by offering a one card to one vendor solution. So you can spin up individual virtual cards and work with your clients to say, okay, not only are we gonna spin up individual virtual cards, so a one-to-one -one card to vendor relationship, but we're also gonna apply those cards to an enforceable budget. Meaning that if you know that every month you are not going to spend more than $500 on Google ads, then this means that you will not be able to be overcharged by Google, right? Say Google inadvertently charges you twice for that. Well, guess what? That's not going to happen because they can't charge you more than the budget allows for that. And the security implications of this are, are obvious, right? If one of these cards gets hacked, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to turn it off for every single vendor. You just shut it off for that one. Um, and virtual cards are, are generally a lot more secure because you can't lose them, you can't take them places. So uh, you know, the inherent value and security value of a virtual card is a lot greater than that of a physical card. So one card to one vendor with enforceable budgets is a massively popular advisory uh, offering that most, um, most, firms are, uh, most firms are offering. So I'm going to go in just very quickly a little bit about Divi, and then we'll hand it back over to Tom here uh, to, to learn just a bit more about um, some of CPA. Tom or Jake, mm -hmm. one of you guys. <laughs> yep. And uh, so Divi, really quickly, we've talked a bit about this, uh, unifying the tech landscape. We're trying to bring all of these independent siloed operations under one holistic platform. We were recently acquired by Bill.com a couple months ago. Many of you probably work with Bill.com. Um, I will tell you, hang, hang on tight. Uh, in the next couple months, you are going to see basically a one-stop shop for any sort of financial operations on behalf of your clients. It's going to be really great. Uh, we have a question here. Let me just bring that up. Uh, how much work goes into having one card to one vendor, and what is the back-end bookkeeping accounting uh, to having many, many virtual cards? So I, I'll answer this in the first the, the first act. There's very little work. Spinning up a virtual card is extremely easy. It's almost instantaneous, and you, you can associate it to an individual budget, or you can just have it draw from a general... Uh, you know, credit amount on a Divi card, right? So the work is very, very minimal and the security gains, like if your virtual cards stop a single card from being lost one time, you will have saved yourself hours, you or your client, right? Um, so the work is very, very minimal. And again, the insight is also real time and the, the budgets are enforceable. So you don't allow your vendors to overcharge you. It's a great question. Uh, going back to this, this is modern fintech. This is what Divi looks like. Um, we won't even jump into this because you've seen so much of it. Um, better for the bottom line. We're talking about the last year and finding every single efficiency you can for your clients and making sure that you absolutely can save them money. Well, guess what? If you have a client where 25 of them are spending and 25 of them need Expensify accounts, and all of a sudden you can replace that and eliminate that monthly you know, SaaS costs and have something for free that works better, <laughs> Great, right? Divi's free. 
And seriously, there's no upsells, there's no contracts, there's no cost. We have kept all of Divi always free for all time, um, which also keeps us beholden to providing a really good product, right? Like you're not staying with us because of a contract. If it doesn't work better, you're going to leave. Your clients are going to leave. Uh, more than that, I also want to just mention quickly our partner program. So we work with accounting firms very, very closely uh, to, to help recommend Divi to your clients and to help make it a really big pillar of your CAS offerings when you're trying to switch up to more advisory services. So grow your offerings as a firm to earn more business from your existing clients, but also make you more marketable. Uh, part of that, uh, the bottom uh, item there, earn revenue on a free product. So we do give rev share for the uh, revenue that we get in when somebody swipes their Divi card. Uh, so there is another uh, revenue pillar that you can operate from there. Uh, questions, look, we're not a sales bunch here. We, we were happy to have a discussion what a partner program could look like for your firm. We're not going to do any hard sales on it. If you don't have anything to sell, it doesn't cost. Uh, if you have questions, hit me up, chad.wait at divipay.com, or you're welcome to learn more at getdivy.com slash partners. And uh, with that, um, I'll let uh, Tom or Yeah, Jay that'll, that'll come back to me. I'm going to go ahead and launch the final yes. um, polling question for people, so let people answer that. But Chad, one story that I have from a client um, is, so the owner had a corporate credit card, didn't really want to give people cards because of the spend management. Like you said, I don't want to put, you know, a sure. $10,000 credit limit in everyone's place. So we did go with Divi cards. It has been a really nice success, including we gave each of his four directors control to set the budgets for their team members. So as this company has gone through ups and downs, CEO tells the marketing director, okay, your budget has gone down. They can go into the individual team members' budgets and make those changes on the fly. And it does give him a nice peace of mind that he's no longer worried about every single person spending up to the limit. And he doesn't find out <laughs> until the very end of the month for that. But yeah, it, it was a nice experience. And we had a nice integration with the Divi person that many of the questions that people were asking were in sessions with these directors where they're saying, here's how you set it up. Here's how you use the app. Here's how it goes. So from my perspective, it was pretty easy that I didn't feel like I had to become a Divi expert to get that implemented. Yeah, that, that's fabulous. You know, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the example I oftentimes like to give, because it, this isn't a real example that I actually heard, but so many companies can relate with it, is, you know, having that type of like, like multiple people owning multiple budgets saying, like, should we be able to allocate this amount for this project or whatever, is really critical to, to managing kind of the holistic spending operations. And the example I give is, you know, everybody had a sales team go out, right? Like a sales team go out, uh, say you're going to a conference in Las Vegas and that sales team, you know, has the appetite for staying at the Bellagio, but the budget for Palace Station, right? Sure. And before that <laughs> wouldn't have been something you would have been able to enforce in real time, but now it actually makes it so that, okay, you know, they're not going to go get the penthouse for you or whatever. And it's a little tongue in cheek, but on the, at the same time, it's also very relatable. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Let me go ahead and close this, close this down. Okay. So. People who are here are here from a learning perspective. If you want to continue that learning, and we do encourage that, we've got a couple different ways. There's the Modern CPA Success Show that people can watch topics. And so we have people from Summit, including some employees. We have clients, we have vendors and others, so you can continue learning around this area. If you want to get connected and engage with other people, we're really excited about the Slack channel that we have, the CFO community. So you'll see a code there to get one month free to try this out. But we have accountants on there interacting with each other and saying, okay, I've got questions, I've got advice to give. There's a pretty active marketing channel. We talk about what webinars are going on, but a lot of it is people saying, hey, how do people approach and do these kinds of things? Um, so those are two things. At least the first month is free, but the Modern CPI Success Show is always free in there. I really encourage that. One of the other things that I will offer is we are really excited about this class we're offering, offering called the Virtual CFO Playbook. So if the idea of advisory services and CFO services is appealing, this is a playbook that goes sort of soup to nuts. How do we do this? You'll see 15 modules. So it's a fairly intensive course, lots of modules, lots of exercises to help someone go from, I don't offer any services through all the different parts of being able to offer those services. There's a free coaching session that goes along with that. There's a book that's included, one year subscription to that Slack community that I mentioned. And then also once per week, a group of CPAs is getting together from multiple firms and have a chat about how things are going. And it's a bit of an accountability team, a lot of questions, a lot of people saying, hey, you talked about this. Can you tell me more about how that is done? And we found that to be a really vibrant meeting that we have. 
and then we have some discounts on software tools. So a couple different offerings kind of as we walk out. Um, on the final slide, I'd like to thank Chad and, Whit and Jake for working us through this today. You have the contact information. Um, you can schedule a consultation with us. Chad shared his email address as a way to get in contact with him at Divi. So if people have follow-up questions, want consultations, things like that, they can go ahead and do that. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. I think we got a lot of good learning from today's session. Yeah, this was fantastic. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be on this series and talking to uh, to all the attendees today. Sounds great. Thank you.